So Crooked Thomas Lee forms the Ohio Land Company in 1748. Thomas Lee and brothers Lawrence and Augustine Washington, who were George Washington's half-brothers, Thomas Lee, Lawrence and Augustine Washington organized the Ohio Company to represent moneyed investors. Uh, land speculators. In addition to the mandate and investment of Virginia Royal Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie, other original members included John Hanbury, Thomas Cresap, George Mercer, John Mercer, George William Fairfax, and George Mason. The Ohio Company was given half a million acres of British land grants in 1749 in the area between the Kanawha River and the Monongahela <laughs> the Mongon the Ma Monongahela River 200,000 acres initially then an additional 300,000 acres with the successful settlement of 100 families within 7 years so the British had Virginia but the Charter for Virginia said all land to the West. So therefore, they owned everything, right? They declared it first. And the Ohio Company, essentially it's a corporation, a land speculat uh, speculating corporation. It's a company. It's for, you know, money. It's in uh, behest of the crown. So it's for the government. But to think that a lot of these... Uh, folks couldn't skim off the top and get themselves a piece. I'm sure Thomas Lee and Lawrence and Augustine Washington, as well as Washington himself, got plenty of land. So there was a, another land company, Crooked John Lewis. He established the Loyal Land Company. And the Loyal Land Company was a rival group of land speculators from Virginia organized about the same time as the Ohio Land Company. The primary founder of the Loyal Company of Virginia was John Lewis, a prominent pioneer in the Shenandoah Valley. The management and direction of the company was concentrated was concentrated in John Lewis. So John Lewis is the man, but there's three other important men, Thomas Walker, Joshua Fry, and Peter Jefferson the father of Thomas Jefferson. So we're already seeing some of these presidents are involved in land speculation. And this is in 1748 and 1749. Uh, in 1750, the Ohio Land Company sent Christopher Gist, a land speculator, a personal land speculator and surveyor for George Washington into Ohio and Kentucky for 150 pounds. He would be one of the first people in Kentucky, one of the first English, uh, white, British uh, people that come into Kentucky. And for some reason that matters. There was a lot of French, there was Dutch, and then, you know, there's about 30 different tribes of Native Americans that were already here uh, for 14,000 years. So, let's see. March 6, 1750, Thomas Walker started the first of many trips into southwest Virginia and what is now Kentucky. The party, led by Thomas Walker, erected a cabin in, at what is now Barberville, Kentucky, to establish the Loyal Company's claim to that territory. So that's March 6, 1750. Okay, so now we understand the Ohio Land Company a little bit, Loyal Land Company. Now let's go to December 1750. Let's see what happened is going on, uh, what's happening with the Gertie family. So in December of 1750, Simon Gertie's father is going to be killed. So Simon Gertie, nine years old right now. In December 1750, Simon Gertie the Elder and Samuel Sanders or Saunders fought or dueled, which ended with Simon Gertie the Elder's death. After both men fired a shot and missed, they pulled out their swords. Simon Gertie made a misstep and fell. Sanders treacherously run him through with his sword, which caused his death. Saunders was either a convict, an escaped bond servant, a soldier, or a rival trader who competed with Gertie and murdered him to steal his trade goods. Samuel Saunders was subsequently arrested, tried in Philadelphia, convicted of manslaughter, and in and imprisoned. Now, however, another source says that Simon Gertie the Elder's head was actually split open with the tomahawk by an Indian called the Fish, and that John Turner, 
who allegedly is his half-brother, avenged Gertie by killing the fish. That sounds like a nice story. I mean, it sounds, if you're going to whitewash something, you know, you might as well lie. You know, a beautiful lie. Have a, a, a beauty of a lie. So Thomas McKee and George Gibson, after Simon Gertie the Elder is dead, applied for Simon Gertie the Elder's estate, his house and his land, and persuaded William Plumstead, the mayor of Philadelphia, to backdate their application by a full year to make it appear legal. So already we're seeing legal shenanigans. So the, the Gertie family, in the last Captain Pipe video, we saw were um, kicked out. George Crogan came in, burned down their houses, kicked them out, fined them a hundred um, pounds or shillings, and then you know, say la vie, fucking live your life now, right? We fucked your, we burned your house down, we made you homeless, we're finding you now. Good luck to you. So that was the last that we had known about the Gertie family, and now we're seeing that uh, the elder is being killed. So the elder is being killed. Um, and it's either by a British officer or by a convict named Samuel Saunders or Sanders who had killed him or it was by the fish. So it's actually unknown how he had died. But it's uh, definitely that he did die. And then Thomas McKee and George Gibson applied for his estate and then they backdated it for a year to make it appear, appear legal. So is that just, you know, convenient? for them that he gets killed and then his estate and um, if he owed money he owed money but uh, to take someone's house you know in their land could you kill them first and then do it McKee claimed Gertie owed him 300 pounds for trade goods he sold to Gertie on credit Plumstead went along with Gibson and McKee's scheme and McKee was subsequently awarded Gertie's estate Three years after Simon Gertie the Elder was killed, his wife Mary married John Turner. So Mary Newton, the English woman, married John Turner, supposedly his half-brother. And then they settled near the land once owned by Simon Gertie the Elder. So if they settled next to the land, then they might have actually seen McKee and Gibson, who took the land, and, you know, then maybe they lived there. Or maybe they were just absentee um, landlords. Okay, so, let's fast forward three years. January 28th, 1753. John Finley, Finley or with a D or without one, I'm not for sure, lived and traded in Eskipikithiki in 1752. Eskipikithiki is the last Shawnee town in Kentucky. The last known permanent Shawnee town in Kentucky. And in 1752, John Finley was there. John Finley, unfortunately, on this day, January 28th, 1753, he was attacked by a party of 50 Christian Conewago and Ottawa Indians, a white French Canadian, and a white renegade Dutchman named Philip Phillips. So this is interesting. There's 50 Native Americans. They're calling them Christians, so they're praying Indians. I don't know how you could tell if their their Christianity, if they're robbing and pillaging and whatnot, um, Conewago and Ottawa Indians. So this is all the French and the Native Americans and the Dutch. They all seem like they could be together. Philip Phillips. We don't hear anything about Philip Phillips for you know anything, and um, a white French Canadian. So okay, all from the Saint Lawrence River come down upon a scalp and hunting expedition against the southern Indians and on January 28th 1753 along the warriors path 25 miles 40 kilometers south of a Skipikithiki near the head of station Camp Creek in Estill County is where the attack takes place Major William Trent wrote the letter that first mentions the word Kentucky regarding the attack on John Finley William Trent, this is the same guy that tried to give smallpox blankets to Turtle Heart and to Momalti. So to Momalti and to, and then he was also under uh, Henry Bouquet. And Henry Bouquet had given smallpox blankets to the Native Americans before. So it's one of the first uh, official uh, recorded incidents of biological warfare in the United States. So, according to William Trent, he
he wrote, I have received a letter just now from Mr. Crogan. So this is the same asshole that burns that burnt the Gertie residence down for moving to Sherman's Creek. They were in Chambers Mill, and then they went to Sherman's Creek, and then they got their house burnt down when they were in Sherman's Creek. I've received a letter just now from Mr. Crogan, George Crogan, wherein he acquaints me that 50-odd Ottawa's, Conawagos, one Dutchman, and one of the Six Nations that was their captain met with some of our people at a place called Kentucky on this side, the Allegheny River, about 150 miles, 240 kilometers from the lower Shawnee town, Shanoa. They took eight prisoners, five belonging to George Crogan and me, the others to Lowry. They took three or four hundred pounds worth of goods, so I guess Lowry had the other uh, three prisoners. I guess you save prisoners and then you can get some money for them. And uh, they took three or four hundred pounds worth of goods from us. One of them made his escape after he had been a prisoner three days. Three of John Finley's men are killed by the little pick town and no account of himself. There is one Frenchman in the company. So they're mentioning one of the six nations, so the Iroquois. There was an Iroquoian person there. There is 50 Ottawa's, Conawagos, one Dutchman. And one of the Six Nations. So the Iroquois was their captain. And then they also mentioned, oh, by the way, there's a Frenchman in their company. I don't know. I mean, there's 60 people there and you're keeping tabs and I don't know. Okay, so, and then where is he? Like, we don't even know where John Finley goes. John Finley was there in 1752. He was there. And then in 1753, January 28th, he's attacked, and then there's no account for him at all. The seven Pennsylvania white traders with John Finley's crew consisted of James Lowry, who is the guy that lost three of his prisoners, David Hendricks, Alexander McGinty, Jabez Evans, Jacob Evans, which could be the same person, William Powell, Thomas Hyde, and then their Cherokee slave. So they have slaves. Cherokee, nonetheless, right? A Native American. The white Pennsylvania traders shot at the 50 Christian Indians and the 50, 50 Christian Indians along with Philip Phillips and that Frenchman and the Iroquois Indian and then Ottawa and what was it? Conawaga? Con, Cano, Conewago. So Ottawa's Conawagos took the whites prisoners, transported them to Canada, and shipped some of them off to France as prisoners of war. Finley fled, and the next time a white person went to Iskipikithiki, the whole town was burnt down to the ground. So that's the last that we know about Iskipikithiki, January 28, 1753. Now, later on that year, 753, December 11th, 1753, we're going to see George Washington start some of the tensions to the French and Indian War. He doesn't. He will eventually start the war. He will ambush and he will kill uh, a French patrol somewhere in the middle of you know the woods somewhere, and he will kill them. And he'll and that starts the French and Indian War. But that happens in 1754. This is December 11th, 1753. You're going to have Robert Dinwiddie the British Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, also part owner of the Ohio Land Company, sends 21-year-old George Washington, along with seven escorts, to serve a notice of eviction to the French at Fort Le Bouf, Le Bouf, which is 12 miles south of Lake Erie, on a fork of French Creek in present-day Waterford in northwest Pennsylvania to defend the Ohio Land Company's speculated holdings. So, George Washington, give a little bit of background about the father of our country, was born into the landed gentry of Virginia in 1732. He was a seventh generation plantation owner. He, when he was 11 years old, he got slaves. He grew up in Mount Vernon, Virginia in 1749 at the age 17, he was appointed official surveyor for Culpeper County, Virginia, a well-paid position which enabled him to begin purchasing land in Virginia. By 1753, Washington had been appointed to the rank of major in the Virginia militia by Virginia's governor in that year, Kaya Suda. Kaya Suda! 
and Washington would meet for the first time as Washington made his first visit to the rough frontier country of western Pennsylvania. Okay, so that's who, a little bit about George Washington. Now, Robert Dinwiddie, the lieutenant governor, not the governor, and a British lieutenant governor. So it's not the, it's not like Virginia today, the governor of Virginia today. It's the British royal governor. The king appointed governors to control each one of these states, and Robert Dinwiddie would have been the lieutenant governor. So he was the guy underneath the guy who was chosen to run Virginia. So he sends 21-year-old, very young George Washington with seven escorts, right, to trek this long path. Fort LeBouf is 500 miles away from Richmond, Virginia. He's coming from Williamsburg, Virginia. But it's 500 miles away. In today's time, it would take a seven to eight hour drive. And it took George Washington two to three months to get to Fort LeBouf. So a lot of the accounts would say, well, he politely just asked them to leave and all this other shit. He did serve notice. And that was it, but um, to not think that his sort of uh, excavation wasn't hostile by its very intent, by its motive. So George Washington departs Williamsburg, Virginia in October 1753, and he made his way into the rugged Trans-Appalachian region with Jacob Van Bram, B-R-A-A-M, a family friend and French speaker. So a translator, right, to help him talk to the French. And Christopher Gist. Again, Christopher Gist. Christopher Gist and Thomas Walker would be one of the first two Englishmen that get credited, at least, for being one of the first British white people to go into Kentucky. So uh, an Ohio company trader and guide goes along with him. So Jacob Van Bram, Christopher Gist, and then five other people. So, on November 15th, 1753, George Washington and six men left Wills Creek, which is now Cumberland, Maryland, for Fort LeBouf. So, he already left Williamsburg in October, and then November 15th, he is found on Cumberland, Maryland, at, on Wills Creek. So, I guess halfway or so. So, British George Washington met with Tana Cherison. So eventually he gets into Pennsylvania, and he meets with this guy named Half King. Now this guy is going to be important for the Battle of Jumon Glen, Jumonville Glen. The assassination of actually Jumonville Glen was George Washington uh, ambush and assassinates this French soldier who was wasn't doing was I don't know what they were doing, but uh, he assassinates him, kills him, and then that starts the French and Indian War, the fourth French and Indian War. The Fourth Intercolonial War, um, also known as the Seven Years' War, since it lasted for nine years, right? But this is 1753, so this is even a year before the official date begins. The official date would be the assassination of Jumonville Glenn and the Battle of Fort Necessity. That's what the history book says was the beginning of the French and Indian War. So we're doing, we're a couple months before that. Okay, so he just sent in a nice, polite, friendly little paper saying, get the fuck out of here, we're going to kill everybody and everything. <laughs> and um, and it was supposed to be a nice peace emissary mission, right? Just all about peace. They didn't want war, they just wanted to be peace. Do as the fuck as we say, give us all this land and get the hell out of here. The French had actually, you know, they were one of the first people in Kentucky, and they had the claim of the Mississippi Valley because they were there first. Okay, so... British George Washington meets with Tana Cherison. Tana Cherison is also called the Half King. So some people say there are no kings and queens in Native American. That's true. There's chiefs and you know other different positions, but they, he was called a Half King in order to overly bloat his position because he wasn't a full king or a chief. He's probably just some Native American that you know was charismatic, and. Um, but uh, since he wasn't a chief, they couldn't call him a king, but they could say, well, he was half king. The half king, Tana Cherison. And other Iroquois chiefs, so British George Washington, the Brit, the old Crooked George, the Brit, Crooked George the Brit met with Tana Cherison and other Iroquois chiefs at a stopover at Logston, Pennsylvania, a Native American trading village near 
Chartier's Creek. When George Washington was only 11 years old, he got 10 slaves. 10. Governor Dinwiddie had actually sent Captain Trent. These are just two facts I want to throw in the middle of this narrative here. But the Robert Dinwiddie, Lieutenant Governor, the British, the corrupt, right, uh, crooked, crooked Dinwiddie, he had actually sent William Trent to talk to the French about getting the fuck out, right? Hey, uh, just out of politeness, uh, get the fuck out. And, um, and William Trent said that he was so terrified by the Native American stories of, you know, of the bloodshed that he didn't want to go. He was too scared. So in a way, you can kind of see why he would do the smallpox biological warfare in uh, 1764. So this is 1753, so this would be 11 years beforehand, but clearly he's scared, it's fearful, and when he does this, he did it out of, um, he'd been in the Ohio country somewhere. I want to say maybe even Fort Duquesne. British military, William Trent and Henry Bouquet, both of these two generals should be put down in uh, American history as starting biological warfare. You know, biological chemical warfare is now illegal. And sure, it's, you know, you got to judge people in their own time periods, but you can also judge them by today's time period. Uh, killing people is wrong. Slavery is wrong. Raping people is wrong. Giving people smallpox on their blankets is wrong. So that's William Trent. William Trent was also the first person who wrote the word Kentucky. He wrote the word Kentucky. And he, uh, in the letter that explained what happened to John Finley, uh, it, just outside of his Skipikithiki. The last Shawnee town, permanent Shawnee town in Kentucky. So, William Trent, biological warfare, first person to write the word Kentucky down, and John Finley. Well, I guess it's just, he wrote Kentucky down, talked about what happened to John Finley, and biological warfare in uh, Pontiac's Rebellion. So, it was right after the French and Indian War is going to be 54 to 63 and then 63 64 is Pontiac's rebellion and that's when William Trent starts sending smallpox blankets out to everybody but we're still in 53 okay so British George Washington stops by Logstown uh, Pennsylvania it's a Native American trading town that he actually seemed very familiar with many of these people uh, George Washington writes in his notes, you know, everything that happened. Who did he get? The six people that he brought with him. He got an interpreter, some people that knew the trade pretty well. He's talking to Native Americans here and there. When he was in Logstown, Pennsylvania, it's actually a good read. It's only about five or six, seven pages or so. So check out George Washington's narrative when he goes to uh, let the French know that, you know, he didn't want them taking their land. So, British George Washington met with Tana Cherison, also called the Half King. So, he's a Seneca leader, but just the Half King, right? He's not a Gaia Suda or a Kaya Suta. But he met with Kaya Suta, he met with Tana Cherison, and then he also met with several other Native Americans. Their names are hard. White Thunder, there was a White Thunder Native American, then there was a Jess Kakake. Jess Kakake, Jess Kakake, to the earth, Native Americans are still alive if you say their names. Mona Katucha. So at Logstown he met up with Mona Katucha, Mona Katucha, Mona Katucha, Jess Kakake, White Thunder, and Tana Cherison, and Kayasuda. It was in Logstown, Pennsylvania, which was near Chartier's Creek nexus with the Ohio River. So I guess Chartier's Creek hits the Ohio River, and Logstown, Pennsylvania is around there. Chartier's Creek, like Martin and Peter Chartier, Chartier, they were with LaSalle, they mutinied, and then they started their own thing. They're white Indians. So they got a creek named after them. It's probably them. Maybe not. I don't know. When the half king, Tana Charson, the Seneca, not a chief, but elevated to half chief, half king, when he was a young boy, his father had been killed 
and boiled and eaten, supposedly by the French. So his father, half king's father, was killed, boiled, and eaten. So, you know, I'm sure that probably brought some trauma to Tana Charson's life. Christopher Gist introduced George Washington to various prominent local leaders, including Seneca War Chief and Simon Gertie's mentor, Kaya Suda. Although initially reluctant, Kaya Suda agreed to accompany George Washington on his trip to Fort LaBeouf and Fort Machout. As an escort, as a friend, as an ally, can't be for sure, but Kaya Suda went with George Washington to Fort LaBeouf. Kaya Suda helped guide Washington along the Allegheny River portion of his journey in Pennsylvania to Fort LaBeouf. Other Iroquois also assisted. British George had called Kaya Suda the hunter. In Washington's personal journal, he called Kaya Suda the hunter. Oh, that's the hunter. George, British George, spent the night of December 8, 1753 at present day Terre Street, Meadville. George Washington's party traveled up the Allegheny to its confluence with French Creek at Venango, where he was told that he must speak to officers located further upstream at Fort LeBeouf. It's like, ah, you can't talk to us. What, you want us to stop constructing the fort, stop doing this? And LaSalle was there first. LaSalle had uh, conquered the French territory. He was there first. So I, I cannot, I don't feel good about these, the British right now at all. And how can we, right? We're going to fight against the British, but this is the same thing, the oppression. December 11th, 1753, George Washington and Christopher Gist arrived at Fort LaBeouf on December 11th, 1753, amidst a raging snowstorm. Perfect, right? December cold, man. Why are they going out in the dead of winter? They better have some good blankets. In the middle of a raging snowstorm, he finally reaches Fort LaBeouf. In spite of George Washington, the British, and Robert Dinwiddie's blustering ultimatum, the commander, the commandant of Fort LaBeouf, Jacques Legardier de Saint Pierre. Jacques, Jacques Legardier de Saint Pierre. So, Saint Pierre, I guess that'd be the easiest way to say it. But I like that. Jacques Legardier. Jacques Legardier de Saint Pierre. A tough veteran of the West. He received George Washington politely. George is like, I'm on a diplomatic mission, not a war mission. Can I talk to you? Get the fuck out. Pack up your bags. Get all your muskets and ammunition and food and all this fort and all this construction, all these buildings, and get on back to France. Get the fuck out of here. Which is what, actually, the Native Americans should have said both to the Dutch, the French, the Swedish, the Finnish, and the British. So... He received George politely, but he was contemptuously rejected his bluster and ultimatum, which he should have. After reviewing Robert Dinwiddie's letter, Lagardier de Saint-Pierre pointed out that the letter was more properly addressed to his superior, New France's governor, the Marquis de Duquesne. So he's saying, why are you saying it to me? Send it to Marquis Duquesne. I am under orders by the Marquis Duquesne, so go to Duquesne and tell him what the fuck you just told me. What well, am I supposed to just go, just because some, the enemy comes up to me, I gotta listen to the enemy. If ISIS was to come up to the Marines fort and be like, hey, you gotta go. I, I don't think that the Marines would be like, well, okay, good point. The letter St. Pierre drafted in response to Robert Dinwiddie was clear and to the point. As to the summons you send me to retire, I do not think myself obliged to obey it. Legardier, Legardier de Saint Pierre also calmly wrote a reply stating that the French king's claim to the Ohio Valley was incontestable. The French own the Ohio Valley. We were here first. So Jacques Legardier de Saint Pierre politely refused to leave. But he gave George Washington two or three days. Stay. He let him quarter. He let him sleep and spend the night. And George Washington 
is sitting there writing about the structure of the Ford, how many guns, how many people, basically casing the joint, casing the joint out, just looking at what they got and for, you know, getting ready for a military invasion. Like a spy, only like a spy who says, hey, French forces, how y'all doing? Uh, y'all need to get the fuck out. Are you not going to leave? Well, can I spend the night? <laughs> yeah, sir, spend the night. Well, I'm drawing up things. Like, how do you not know that that's what he's doing? And St. Pierre should, I mean, I, why would you let George Washington leave? Overall, George Washington was impressed by St. Pierre in this encounter. After a couple of days, before George Washington had left, Cayasuda abruptly returned to Logstown, Pennsylvania. Cayasuda just out of nowhere just goes back to Logstown. George Washington took careful notes of the military arrangements at both forts before departing on December 16th. George was somewhat concerned by the fact that Tana Charison and his men remained behind for further discussions with the French. So George is mad that he rolled to the party with Tana Charison, but the half king is going to stay there anyways. And he saw that every stratagem which the most fruitful brain could invent was practiced to win half king to their interest. So they were trying to win over the Native Americans to their cause. And so not all the Native Americans that went with George Washington to Fort LaBeouf left with him. In fact, it just seems like it's just him and Christopher Gist. Just him and Christopher Gist and maybe a couple other guys who, who go back. So George Washington now is going to return to Williamsburg, Virginia, after a month or two of difficult travel. On making the perilous return trip from Fort LaBeouf, George and Christopher Gist nearly died that winter when their raft capsized, broke apart, attempting to cross the icy Allegheny River and French Creek. They also, there was a French soldier that had shot at him, and he went ahead and uh, arrested him for the day and then let him go at night. George Washington's journal was such good frontier reading for the Times that Virginia's British Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie had it published both in Williamsburg, Virginia, and in London, England. Washington's published account was widely read, and his engaging tales of travel, diplomacy, and adventure helped advance his career as an up-and-coming political leader. The book also elevated Washington as one of the country's first frontier heroes. One of those who read and commented on George Washington's published account was none other than Britain's King George II. George II, who wasn't anything like his piece of shit father, who threw his mother, his, King George II's mother, his wife, in prison for 33 years. And then when she died of kidney failure, that bastard died a week later. So, King George II loved George Washington. Uh, January 16th, 1754, George Washington returned to Williamsburg, Virginia. And they were so pleased with his discoveries, with his journal, with what he was able to accomplish, was awarded a 50-pound reward. Like, wow, damn. You weren't even a spy. You just walked up to him and was like, hey, can, can I see your shit? Can I see what you guys are doing here? In 1754, John Turner Jr. was born to Mary Newton and John Turner the stepfather to Simon Gertie. 1754. So that would be that year, the year after. Okay, so where are we at now? Now we are at May 28th, 1754 when George Washington starts the World War. The Fourth French and Indian War, the Fourth Intercolonial War, the F Seven Years War, even though it only lasted for nine years. George Washington is going to go back into the Ohio country. He's going to go to Fort Duquesne, and not with an ultimatum, not with a letter, but, you know, there to kill people. He was, I mean, I don't even know why would you go back there again. But that would be May 28th, 1754, and that will be the assassination of Jumonville Glenn, and that will be the beginning of the French and Indian War. Kaya Suda!